Hi everyone, welcome to Dropping Your Armor, where we listen to stories from thinkers, doers and dreamers in the hope of unlocking our infinite human potential. I'm your host Neha and I hope you're all well. It's the end of the year and it's snowy and cold and my city is lit up with a thousand lights, there's a faint smell of hot chocolate in the air. So I don't know about you, but for me, this is the time to get cozy and reflect. So I invited my friend Brian to accompany me on the journey to reflect on what it means to drop our armor with different people in our lives. We exchange stories on what it feels like to be vulnerable to drop our armor at work, with family, with friends and in relationships. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Dropping Your Arbor. I'm so glad that we're finally doing this. How are you today? I'm doing great, Neha. How are you doing? It's great to finally be doing this together, uh, and I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks. Thanks for having me. I am too. And before we actually dive in, Brian, do you want to take a few minutes to, well, not a few minutes, maybe a couple of sentences to introduce yourself to the listeners? Sure, absolutely. So my name is Brian Stahl, and I worked with Neha um, Cross. Regions. You worked in the German company. We worked at the same company for about five years. And you worked in the German office. I worked in the United States. And now I'm still in the talent development field, but at a different company right now. And, you know, we, we've been able to still communicate, even though we don't work at the same organization anymore. And uh, I'm glad that you invited me on to, to, to be this. I, I live in, I said I live in the United States. I live in New York. And I'm originally born and raised in a small state in the middle, kind of in the middle of the United States called Ohio. Thank you so much, Brian. And for the listeners, right? So you already know that Brian and I have known each other for a long time. So this is going to be a very open and, and casual conversation. And one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to Brian was because he's just very authentic. I mean, this guy does not have a filter and I mean it in the nicest way. <laughs> and <laughs> I am looking forward to hearing all the crazy stories that he's going to share with us. Um, but before we go down that road, my filter Brian, has backfired sometimes. My no filter has backfired sometimes. And I, it we'll has. Talk, yeah, we'll talk about those lessons learned. Maybe we'll get to some of those. I don't know. Maybe, yes, you know, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> all right. Well, um, before we actually go into this conversation, and I'm super excited to introduce this conversation because it's going to be a very special kind of episode. Before we go there, uh, we want to do a little bit of a check-in or a tune-in because we always do it and uh, it helps us understand you a little bit better. So Brian, the holiday season is, is coming up and I want to know what is a special Stoll family tradition during the holidays that you love so much and that you do every year? Well, I, I don't have one f for my family, but I've got one with my closest friend, my best friend, Scott, and his wife that we do. This sounds really... Oh, that's your chosen family. Yeah. That's perfect. So, Go for it. So my best friend, Scott, and his wife, Megan, this sounds... I don't know. Maybe this is a little bit vulnerable. It sounds a little bit basic. We get together and we watch Love Actually every single year together, right around like the... 23rd or 22nd of Christmas, and we always have to rewind it, and we talk about so many parts, and we've done it for probably, I'd say, like 12 consecutive years. We always get together, and we watch Love Actually right before Christmas, so that's- Oh my God, I love that. I always look forward to, and I can't, you know, we can't wait to do it, so. I love that. I love that movie, and in fact, my personal holiday tradition, just not with my family, just with myself, is actually Love Actually and uh, The Holiday. That's another nice holiday movie that one. to watch. You never saw that one. Yeah. I would recommend yeah, it. You should look into you, that. Yeah, I'll look into if that. You, if you have a pretty high, you know, cheesiness factor, which I think you do, you, you you'd enjoy it. But it's it's also really it's a really great movie. <laughs> okay. you, you feel the you feel the holiday spirit there. <laughs> hopefully, our, hopefully the audience didn't tune out already at that. Wow, this guy seems exciting. He's watching a movie at Christmas time. That's. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, they're still listening. <laughs> Yeah. It's okay. It's it's a million dollar movie business is built up on pushing out Christmas movies. I'm getting all these re Netflix recommendations right now. Yeah. I mean, someone's got to watch them. So that's right, that's right. Uh, yeah. It's gonna be you. It's gonna be you. <laughs> okay. So I already hinted that this conversation is going to be a special one. It's a special episode. We're wrapping up the year, and we had some wonderful conversations with different people about what it means for them to drop their armor, and they shared their different stories and different situations and. 
what Brian and I wanted to explore was how does one drop their armor or what does dropping your armor really look like in different aspects of one's life? So at work, what does it feel like to drop your armor? At, at your home, with your family, what does it feel like to be truly vulnerable? With your friends and with, in your relationships, how does authenticity look like in those relationships as well? So maybe, Brian, to um, kick off, um, I want to ask you, what does dropping your armor feel like to you and what exactly does it mean to you? Wow. So, so the two, so, so two part, how does it feel to me? I think initially how it feels to me is that deep down in your gut, that uneasy feeling of like, there's something I need to share and it's super uncomfortable, whether it be a mistake in the workplace, whether it be um, something with a partner, a relationship, or a friend, like something that's really deep down embarrassing that you think that there might be a ramification on the other end of it, right? That there might Mm -hmm. be a judgment coming back to you, or there might be uh, something that could happen at work if you share something at work, like, oh, could my job be at risk or something like that, right? Um, So to me, if it feels like this uneasy feeling to begin with, but then after you release it, like I just feel like this gigantic weight is off my shoulders. Like, good. I was bottling that in and I feel just, I feel like free. I feel, Oh, okay. I shared that. That's who I am. And that was uncomfortable to share, but I was so glad that I shared it. Yeah, that's, that's great. I can, I can really resonate with that. I, you, you feel the sense of relief, right? Because, uh, I mean, the armor is there to protect you, but it, it has weight. It, it, it comes at a cost to you. So initially it's like dropping it is, is a little bit unnerving because you feel exposed um, and that you have that uneasiness, as you said. But once you do, you also have the sense of relief that you're no longer carrying something heavy that you needn't, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and what is it like, what exactly does that mean to you uh, in, in terms of a definition? If you were to define uh, dropping your armor, vulnerability, how would you explain it to someone? I, I, I would say that in just in like really s- simple, simplistic terms, to me, how I would define that dropping your armor vulnerability as just because vulnerability is a really, really popular word right now. And it's a really, really big buzzword and it's shared a lot of, but a lot of times people are like, what does that mean? And I think it means something different to, to most, to, to people. And like I said a little bit earlier, it's that something that you are sharing that you think that there's, there's something bad coming on the other end, or you're like super embarrassed to admit it, or you don't want to admit it because you think that other people are going to look down upon you or, or whatever it may be, or that you're not perfect or you're not good enough or you're, you're not. And especially that could come into settings. Like if you're think of, you're sitting in a room with a bunch of PhDs, right. Mm-hmm. And, and you're like, I don't have my PhD. Like, right. The, all these people are scientists and they're super smart and they make more money than I do. Whatever it may be, you could be really embarrassed to share something like that. Like, so I think that just in simplistic terms is something that just really just feels uncomfortable to share. Right. Um, I don't know how it's a hard word to define though, isn't it? Like it's hard to really define it and really put how, how does it feel for you? Well, it's similar. And, and I think, uh, I think what I, um, To me, it it has to do with, I mean, this is also overused, right? I'm going to draw on Brene Brown's work on vulnerability. It is courage at the end of the day. Um, It is is about uh, feeling that personal risk in that moment um, and, you know, just still being authentic with yourself and with others in that moment. And it's really hard to do. Um, But there are different layers. And and I think it's also a, a term that is, as you said, it means d- different things to different people. And it's it's also sometimes misunderstood or misused, uh, especially if I look at the way in which it's used on social media, right? It, it uh, And it's my opinion here. It's so maybe 
if anyone disagrees with me, would also be curious to uh, have a debate on this one. But this, this whole vulnerability movement that's happening on social media about showing your flaws, right? Like let's let's highlight the fact that we have cellulite or stomach rolls or something, which I think is is really great in, in on one hand because it goes away from the kind of uh, media influences that I was raised on, which were all around, you know, being very skinny and being perfect with airbrush makeup, everything. So on the one hand, it shows more forms of reality or actually the truth to everyone. But on another hand, it could also be seen as covert narcissism, right? You're, you're, you're banking on your vulnerability, you're commoditizing your vulnerability to become an influencer. And I know it's, it's, it's a very fine line, you know, what is vulnerability and what is not, um, is an interesting discussion, which I would really want to discuss with you in, in the realm of different areas, because so often it could also seem like vulnerability is all about sharing everything that you feel, but it's also not, right? You, When you do that, you emotionally hijack a situation and you make other people feel uh, uncomfortable. Or if you're using vulnerability to sort out your own shit, that's not really vulnerability in that moment or not helpful, at least. But there, there is a fine line between vulnerability as, as courage and vulnerability as used as a shield to protect uh, yourself once more, which is not vulnerability at all. I don't know if that made sense to you at all. Yeah. No, that, that, that makes total sense. And I'll go, if you, if you want to go on the social media, I'll, I'll go one step further as, as a third thing is also maybe it's being used as a tool for people to say, oh, you're beautiful. You're so real. You're so authentic. Look at you. You're just the way you are. And they're doing it to cover up maybe some insecurities. So then it's almost you're using vulnerability to cover up insecurities and you want praise for it. So I think it's important to really understand like, what is the purpose of why am I sharing this? If you can really ask yourself deep down that question, what is the purpose of me sharing what I'm going to share? And if you get down to that, then I think that that can really be true vulnerability. Exactly. Right? You can really understand that. But the, only that person that's sharing it is going to really know that. Yes, exactly. I love that. Because what would what, uh, what, what someone share on social media like, just who I am. But the real purpose of this objective, is, the objective of this is really just to get likes because I'm insecure. Like if people did that, that's authenticity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. If you're using it for social validation, it's not vulnerability at all. But as you said, it's, it, it lies within the person. So it's, it's, it's more of an internal dialogue and it starts with yourself before anything else. So I, I love that. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for Making that point more eloquent, the, the point that I wanted to state, I, I loved how you crystallized it. Well, that's what social, that's why I ended up getting off social media, because I tried to ask myself that question. And I said, why am I posting this? And I didn't like the answer that I was telling myself. And it was like, this is so superficial. So yeah. I'm getting off. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm actually on... Well, I'm partially off social media. I'm still on the first stage of detaching myself from social media. I went from uh, being a contributor to now a passive observer, but definitely had one of those moments yesterday when I was doom scrolling at night. I'm like, why am I doing this? This is not useful. This is not helping anyone, not me, no. So yeah, I think yeah. I might be inspired to get off social media entirely. Yeah. It's like when, uh, last thing on social media, it's like when someone says, oh, you're doing you're doing okay. Are you doing okay? I haven't seen you on social media. Are you doing all right? Like, yeah, that's why. I, yeah, I am I'm fantastic doing all right. because yeah, I'm not because, on social media. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well, Brian, let's not let's not talk talk about this in the context of work. So we we discuss what is vulnerability, uh, that it starts from you, from within, right, and and the purpose that you have to be vulnerable with someone else. How does that show up for you at work? Do you have any examples or stories of when you dropped your armor at work? Yeah. Um, multiple times, but I think it's started to really change over the past few years. I've worked in some perfectionist cultures before that was almost like it was hard to make a mistake or mistakes weren't welcome. So I think it's first recognizing a couple barriers, <clears throat> I would say, 
that make it comfortable to share, to be vulnerable at work. And those are really the ego barrier and your blind spot barriers. So like when you kind of let that ego go and you and you start to figure out what your blind spots are, that's going to help you develop as an individual. So the vulnerability really started for me as a personal development vehicle, right? So for example, I remember a co like I was in this meeting uh, a few months ago and I was just having a, I got distracted, something came on and I was having a hard time following. And a coworker of mine said, Brian, it looks like you're having a hard time keeping up on this conversation. I was like, wow, you know, she's right. That it. But I was so glad that she shared that because, and speaking up on something like that, hey, I'm having a hard time following. Can we go back to that last statement? Just, I want to make sure to capture it. Mm -hmm. I would rather have that take place than someone not get the information. Does that make sense? So sharing something like that, just as something as simple as that. So letting go of that ego blind spot and using it as a vehicle to develop and get better and work together to get the results. That's how I use it. Hmm. Yeah. And I think you said something really important here, which is definitely a part of my armor, but I also see that a lot of people at work struggle with as is, is perfection, right? That's, that's a, it's a, it's a common, um, common material that people's armors are made up of at work. And, um, it's hard to let go of that perfection. It's so connected to your ego. And, and I think in a system where you're, you're brought up, you're raised being, uh, sort of, uh, rewarded for how good you are, the marks you get, you know, how, uh, great you are all the time that it's, it's hard to be the person in the room that goes like, well, I'm sorry, but I don't really follow or I don't really know the answer to that. Right. right. Um, and, and it's, you're right. It's, it, it is about that journey of detaching yourself from your ego and being truthful. Right. And, and, and I think when that you are in a perfectionist culture or, uh, or you're around by people that are maybe a little bit perfectionist that don't, and it really boils down to just owning up to mistakes and seeing mistakes, like letting mistakes come to the surface. And if you're, around that where it's not acceptable to make mistakes or it's not okay to make mistakes, that authenticity and that vulnerability and that dropping your armor, that it doesn't show up. Mm -hmm. It blocks it all from happening. So when you see these, the largest companies in the world stumbling and failing and redesigning and changing and working through the goals always happen always happen. So even the smartest, best, brightest people in the world are making mistakes all the time. And you learn from those mistakes. So I guess it's part of that, that living and just recognizing that no one's got it all figured out. And how do you, how do you learn from that? But if it's not, if it's in this, if it's in a company culture, that's just perfectionism and everyone's buttoned up, then to me, that feels inauthentic because People are making mistakes. And then it kind of adds fear and anxiety inside of an organization. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh, you have so many, as you said, right, vulnerability is in right now. I mean, uh, Brene Brown, I have to give her credit. She she made it hot. So everyone wants to be vulnerable. Everyone wants to have that on their walls, right? But it's it's if, if the culture is actually secretly against it, there is that perfection, that high demand. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't stand, right? You can have that as an espoused value, but it may not be the truth. And then you need to have psychological safety for vulnerability to to be present otherwise it's people are not going to be taking that personal risk in that situation and what and, and so you're talking about that psychological safety as well so that that vulnerability could you share on like what that means to you or with some of the maybe some of the companies that you work with or inside your company or just in your environment of is it that psychological safety is permission to be vulnerable or and it's accepted and lived? Well, I think with psychological safety, and I, I think maybe we can even do like a spotlight episode on psychological safety, but um, 
I think what's interesting is that it, it's, it's a team-based construct. So first of all, uh, I should maybe correct myself that it's not psychological safety in an organization. It, psychological safety as a construct, it exists in teams. And teams mm-hmm. are the home base of people. Uh, right when they're when they're in the bigger organization, and I think that's a great place to start. If you have psychological safety as a, in a team, where by psychological safety I mean the ability of people to um, to uh, to share interpersonal risk, right, without feeling like they would be uh, uh, they would be penalized for it, um, and and to show up um, as they who they really are. If that starts within a team, that can do a lot to help people, even if the larger organizational culture is a little bit against it. Now, of course, this this does create some friction, right? It's it's you you cannot have two philosophies existing in an organization for a long time. So eventually, what you'd want is that team to, you know, work with other teams to to spread that. Uh, uh, that that team culture into and turn it into an organizational culture, uh, but psychological safety in a team setting is I, I would say is super valuable in, in terms of you know helping people be who they are. On an organizational level, I think it's important that leaders create that culture of um, of openness, right? Uh, of of if you want if you want an organization that is innovating. Um, that is the first to the market with the newest products, it will not happen if your people are petrified of taking risks. I mean, innovation requires yeah. risk. So it it needs to be a part of your business strategy to create that culture because we know that culture is everything at the end of the day. Um, we can talk a lot about work and I also have some uh, interesting work stories, which I won't go into right now because I am very curious about um, how vulnerability shows up for you uh, with your family. And Brian, I know you have a very special story here. Um, can, can you can you share that one? Yeah, so the, the, the family one, you know, I think it does look, it vulnerability looks different and work and family and friends. And there are some things that you'll share with the closest people in your lives that you might not share with someone else who you also define as the closest person in your life. And that could be like your mom and dad, right? So like a lot of times people are like, my mom's the close, to me, my mom's like very, very close to me. And, but my friends, like some of my best friends know exactly like every single deep, like they know it all. And some of that stuff you kind of hide from your from your mom. Right. So a couple years ago, I was talking to this gal who, you know, I was in, I'll just say I was in love with, and she was a conservative Christian and I was an atheist. And for whatever reasons, it didn't work out. And because it didn't work, I was bumming, right. I was like disappointed. I wasn't my normal self and I wasn't my normal self for a month. It also came at a time with the pandemic. And so multiple things were happening at one time. And my mom knew I was off, but didn't, she didn't know Mm -hmm. why. Right. She's like, how's it going? I'm like, okay, things are good. Right. And then I was like, I just got to tell her what happened. Right. But in order to do that, I've, she doesn't know that I'm an atheist. Right. She, she, she might think that I don't go to church. She knows that I don't go to church and we grew up in a very Christian household. So I just had to share it with her. I was like, hey, look, I got to, you know, I have to tell you something. I was like, the reason that I'm not my normal self and the reason it didn't work with this lady was because I'm an mm-hmm. atheist, right? So I had to come up. I don't believe in God or I don't even remember how I shared it. I remember exactly where I was. It was super uncomfortable. I was pacing back and forth. All those feelings of like sharing that and there were, you know, a long pause on the end and super, super uncomfortable for to share that. My best friends knew it. A couple of coworkers knew that I was an atheist, but my mom and dad didn't know that because I didn't share it vocally. So it was something that I hid from them for decades, I would say. Oh, and how did that go? What happened when you shared it with your mom or how, how did she react? The, the first part came with question. The first part came with questioning. Like, 
the first part actually came with recognition as she said, she shared, she said, you know what? I remember when you were very, very young in like first or second grade and you started questioning this and you were asking questions and she goes, I feel so bad that I didn't have the answers. I remember her saying that, like, I feel so bad that she didn't have the answers. And that's why I said, well, that's part of the reason why I did because I couldn't get the answers and I didn't think anyone had the answers. And I, didn't want to personally base it on faith. I wanted to base it on fact and reality. And then it came to asking questions of, well, do you believe X? Like, do you believe this? Do you believe if you die, you go to heaven? If you believe, you know, so then she kind of got in some of that specifics and I shared, you know, no. And this, and then, I mean, even at this, like even still to this day, that was two years, a little over two years ago. She'll still send me, she'll ask me to watch a sermon or she'll ask me, she'll send me a scientific thing of a scientist said this about religion. So it's still coming, but I think now she's coming around to it. And she, the one thing that's changed now is she says, I know you don't believe this, but dot, dot, dot. She never said that before. She never said, I know you don't believe Mm. this. So now she started to say that. So she So she accepts that you don't believe uh, in God, but she doesn't accept your belief yet. Or non belief. Yes, yet. she yeah. Yeah. She yeah, she accepts it, but and, and you know, at the same time it's 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 tough because and it's tough to t- talk about because it's so important yeah. to her, right? And she believes that when we die that we're gonna be reunited together. And I don't think mm-hmm. that, right? And so she thinks that when she dies that everyone's going to be reunited, but I'm not going to be there. And that's hard for her. And that's tough. So I I get that too, but as far as the armor go, I had to share that. I had to share that with her cuz she knew something was off. She knew I wasn't my normal self. And what was the catalyst to to do that? What, why was that happening? And I had to just be authentic and be real and share with mm. her. And it was something that I wanted to share for years and years and years. But always hid it behind that, behind that armor. Why did you hide it? I think it goes back to that order. It was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable and you didn't know what the reaction was going to be. Mm. Right? And, and for just sharing non beliefs there's other people all across the world that hide stuff because the way that they think that parents could react or someone could react and sometimes it's in a terrible terrible way of you know parents disown kids or ostracize them from the family or not welcome so to think that that could potentially happen is, is kind of, te- you know, it's kind of terrible. Yeah, of course. And so, but what I shared is nothing compared to what other people have going on in, in their lives. So I think it goes to, to ask why I shared it. Cause it was like deep down that feeling of like, this is uncomfortable. This is hard mm-hmm. to share, but she needs, but she needs mm-hmm. to know. I think that also, I mean, it connects to a little bit of why armors are formed, right? What you shared was, early in life, you didn't know how your parents might react to that, that feeling, that, that side of you. And so you developed an armor because that would have been the thing that protected you from that possible negative reaction, right? So you, you put up that shield because it protected you. And yeah. it serves that purpose. So it's, it's not a bad thing in the sense that it serves that purpose. It protected you. It probably also, you know, um, didn't rock the boat on your relationship with your parents for a few years, right? But uh, at some point you realize that it was costing you too much and you just needed to share it. You just needed to do it because it was, it was too painful to, to keep right. on that protection. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It was too painful. And you know, my mom understands me and to be understood is absolutely incredible. So to feel, and that that's better than feeling love, mm-hmm. I'd say be understood. And she, she gets it. And now she might not agree with it or it still might be hard, but it's out there now. And yeah. So yeah, that, that shield was up there because 
it was uncomfortable and it was just didn't know the ramifications, didn't know what, what the reaction was going to be. How did you feel during and how do you feel now? During, like, during I was pacing back and forth. Like I remember I was in my apartment. I was just walking back and forth. And when I talk on the phone, I often pace back and forth when I'm walking. So, but, um, afterwards I felt the sense of relief of like, finally it's out there. And she even said like, she knit, like she deep down, she probably knew too. She just didn't want to, you know, talk about, didn't want to talk about it. And it was kind of funny because you go back into that, you know, you're kind of skirting around it or dancing around something like that. Like, let's say she asked if, Hey, are you going to church this week, this weekend? And like, no, I'm not going. Well, why aren't you going to? And so you're kind of mm. dancing around really what you're trying to get get at when you kind of know the answer. So we talk about being real and authentic and genuine. Like, let's just stop dancing around this. And rather than you asking me go to church or I'm not going to go to church or I'm not going to donate my money to a church, well, why are you not? Well, it's because of my belief system. Yeah. So like, I don't know, I looked at that as like, almost like, let's stop dancing around, beating around the bush, get, get to the point. Like, and then when you have that armor dropped and you have that layer dropped, then you can actually start to be um, really authentic. And then that's when, so feeling afterwards is that's when you really feel like, ah, this is my mm -hmm. true self. This is who I am. This is, and it's that gigantic weight that's off your shoulder of like, I don't have to hide anything in anymore. I'm just me. I'm real. I'm authentic. And how's your relationship? With my mom? Yes. It's great. Like it, I talk, talk to her like four times a week still, you know, I text awesome. almost every day. Yes. So it's, uh, I get to see her tomorrow and I can't wait, you know, can't wait. So now, I mean, we might have to do a recap cause I'm sure that she'll, uh, ask me something about my, you know, about something about religion when I'm there, but it's just, it's what it is. Now. So, <laughs> so you have to now, remind her, but <laughs> so now can, yeah, but we can, now that that stuff's out there, we can navigate it well. We can yeah. have more, we can have better conversations, right? Yes. Because of it. Yes. We can have better conversations because we know who the other person is. So mm -hmm. I'm high. I talked all about I me. Mean, I don't want to hog this whole thing. What about, is there something with you with family that is different dropping your armor versus work or personal or friends, if you'd be willing to share? It's, uh, it's very different, dropping your armor at work or with family or with friends. I think there is a huge difference. Um, you don't have to share a specific example of what's a huge difference, but like, who knows the most out of those three functions? Who knows the most about me? Mm-hmm. Oh, friends, 100%. Friends, okay. 100%. I think, like I said, right, friends are your chosen family. And like, your family is great, your colleagues are great. But I think friends have a special place. Um, and at, at least in my life, my friends have a very special yeah. place uh, in my life. And um, I'm, I'm a person who has very few, but very close friends. So I'm not the one who's going to have like... Uh, 50 friends or a hundred or whatever, right? It's, it's, I would call them acquaintances, not friends, but, um, I tend to have five people who are at all times closest to me at one time. in like at one point in my life, there will be five people. Now I think two or three of those five people have been the five people that have been closest to me throughout my life. But some of them, you know, they come in and out depending on where you're going into your life and where you are, which stage of your life you're in. But at any point in time, I have five people who are closest to me and they will, they will know, they will know a lot about me. Maybe not everything. I still try to, I still want to keep some things private and I think that's, that's okay. And being vulnerable to me doesn't mean that I'm an open book, but I can choose to be vulnerable with them because there's a lot of trust uh, in those relationships. Um, which I really value and I'm, I'm grateful for. So what it looks like is also, I, I know I know my level of friendship with someone depending upon the 
the kind of humor I use as well. I noticed that. So I have, I, I think I'm a very funny person. Most people don't think so, but I think I'm hilarious. And I feel like I have this <laughs> 4D humor, right? <laughs> it's, and, you're, and, you're, and you're humble. And I'm very humble, of course. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. part of being vulnerable is also, it's, it's not about exaggerating your strengths or, you know, uh, diminishing your, debasing yourself. Vulnerability also means having an accurate assessment of yourself. I think I'm yeah. hella funny. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I continue. Go ahead. What so, were you saying? Well, I, I know that my level of humor changes around people when I am getting closer to them, when I have more uh, more of an opportunity to be vulnerable with them. And I, and I see it as like I have this 4D humor. So the first layer is always dry. Like when you meet me first, you don't know me. The kind of humor that I would use is very dry, very like, yeah, you won't even notice if there's humor you might be confused most of the time around me which is perfectly fine the second layer becomes a little bit dark so now you know i I will access some of those more morbid forms of humor which make some people really uncomfortable but you know what there is a time and place for everything and i think there's a time and place for dark humor as well the third layer when you become closer to me is um is a dirty humor so dirty jokes really no filter completely dirty jokes, not safe for work. I will not say any jokes here on this podcast. So don't even ask me about it, Brian. I'm not going to tell you any dirty jokes. And the last one is dad jokes. So this is when you're super, super close to me. You're going to hear some of the lamest dad jokes there ever are. And (laughs) that part of that vulnerability is also... (laughs) Yeah, my, my, my level of humor tells me, gives me an indication of how safe I feel with that person to, to really unleash the most, most lame and uh, not so witty parts of me. Let's just put it that way. Does that make sense to you at all? <laughs> it's a totally, give, me a, give, me a, give me a dad joke, right? Give me one of your favorites. No, I can't do that. No, 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 no. It's, it's, so it's dad jokes in the moment. It's not dad jokes like, let me tell you a joke about a priest and a rabbi and a rabbit. You know, it's not. Ah, not okay. No, no, no. They're like in the moment, really lame dad jokes. Like I access my inner Phil Dunphy um, in those moments. So, ah, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's not like I used to be addicted to the hokey pokey, but I turned myself around. Yes. No. Like, <laughs> okay. No. Well, I think that that's. That's actually funny that you share that because when it comes to humor, I feel the exact same way. And I think that there's an armor that comes up at work and there's a level of when to put up an armor. And what you talked about, dry, dark, offensive, dad joke, all the cheesy jokes. I love it. And one of my favorite things to do, I live in New York. One of my, my, actually my favorite thing to do is go to this place called the Comedy Cellar. And it's this like one of the most famous comedy clubs in the world and it's like in this basement and it's like super gritty and super scrappy and everyone seals up their phones and you can't record you can't take pictures and you're hearing comedians a lot of them are working out new material so that's why they they they, they seal up the phone so you can't record it and it can't get escaped out in the world and so much at our time in my professional life i'm super buttoned up, right? I'm very, very professional, right? Very welcoming. And to maybe laugh at a joke that would be considered offensive at work, (laughs) that might not be the best place. So you got to kind of button it up. And then I go to the comedy club and I just let it all out. And I'm just dying laughing at dark, twisted, offensive stuff. And I care more about the craftiness of the joke and the misdirection and how it comes and how well it's written that I love. And nothing feels better than to just laugh. Like when your stomach's hurting to laugh, it is, to me, it's the best emotion that, that's out there, right? It's just laughing. And that's why, you know, being around my friends. But I will put up that armor when I see stuff that I was, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there is an audience for everything, right? Like I'm not going to go around cracking offensive jokes uh, in, in meetings because, well, it might actually hurt someone and I don't want to hurt anyone, right? The people who right. know me, know me really well, know that when I'm in my, one of my, you know, no censored moods, I will, I, I'm, I'm just trying to entertain and I'm just 
having a blast. So it's it's not about anyone or anything. But people who don't know me that well, they will take offense. And um, it has backfired in the past. So I learned very quickly that some humor levels are for certain audiences only. And let's keep it that way. And it's it's good for everyone. Yeah, and that might come down to trust, right? A, a level of trust that you trust an individual so much that they're not going to share anything. And that feels safe versus where you could have shared something and someone goes, hey, Neha said this. Can't, like, they didn't know that you were joking. They didn't know your sense of humor. Or they might have not found it funny and they wanted to you know, tell somebody else. And when you have that level of trust with someone, like you know that it's safe with that person. And that's where that's kind of hard to... Hard to earn. Yeah, I will say though that my jokes are still very value based. Like I, I do not, I do not engage in racist jokes. Like that, that's just like a low blow. Like I just, no, I don't no, think that's not who you. I do. No, 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 no. But um, yeah, they they can get really painful in terms of the level of lameness, especially when it comes to dad jokes. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you sometime later. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, but um, what what about you, uh, Brian? Like. When, when, when we, now we kind of transitioned in from family to friends, right? And relationships. And you also started sharing a little bit about your experience and um, with your relationship. Um, do you experience dropping your armor differently when it comes to relationships and friendships? E- yes. Yeah, I would say. Well, the relationship, I haven't figured it out because I'm single. So I'm not like the best person to ask about figuring it out and a, a personal relationship that's still a work in progress still trying to figure that out i'm still trying to figure out when to share and what to share what i've started to kind of work on is that level of, if someone is willing to share this i'm willing to share with them does that make sense like not essentially not oversharing, mm-hmm. right like not over like if they're willing to share something, I'm willing to share something. Like a kind of an equal playing field. Especially like your point about not oversharing, right? So, I mean, one challenge that I would have is if you always rely on the other person to share first, right? Um, and the other person is probably thinking the same thing. You probably won't move anywhere in your relationship, right? You'd both be waiting on each other. Right, yeah. So <laughs> right. Yeah. maybe, maybe there's, I don't know, another way to gauge um, how you could. Well, I think I think that that's because I've learned from, like, I, I guess I'm trying to learn from mistakes is because I would be too open and honest and not think about, I wouldn't think about what I was saying. It would just come out. Mm. So, for example, I was dating somebody in New York and she was like, do you want to go get breakfast? Um, and I was like, no. I, you know, I, that just <laughs> kind of came out. Like, I was like, would you? And she was just like, you're so honest. She's like, I've never been around someone who's just like so honest and shares how they're feeling. I was like, it's uh, it's a learning development thing. I need to. Well, to it's a is that honesty in the like, U.S. Like, like saying no to breakfast? I mean, I, I think it's like the most normal thing to hear. Well, you would happens. think so, but at the time, I was tired and I didn't want to go to bre- like I didn't want to go get <laughs> breakfast, right? So instead of saying, you know, instead of saying, "Well, I'm really tired and like a dude," uh, so putting know, in the qualifiers, you didn't do I, that it, exactly. Yeah, I just like came out and said it. Or there's there's times where people would just go okay well i'm gonna go to breakfast but i really don't want to go to breakfast or i don't want to you know but they you just do it because you don't want to and i guess like part of me just being myself all the time like i try not to i just share how i'm feeling mm. if that mm. makes sense yeah i think that maybe sometimes that, that can backfire and not be re- received that well on the other end right yeah, yeah, I understand. I think part of it is also cultural, right? And Brian, you spent some time in Germany when we were here. I think you saying no to a breakfast inf- invitation just with the word no, no as a sentence, right, as a full sentence, would be perfectly acceptable. I wouldn't see anything wrong with that, right? <laughs> it wouldn't be a dropping your armor moment, you know? It would be like a, yeah, regular moment. I don't want to have breakfast. <laughs> that's that's okay. But it is it is cultural, right? And the it's maybe it's... it's um, it's too honest in some situations and probably needs a little bit of padding uh, before you can be that right. that direct. Yeah. Padding is a good word. In Germany, it's like, 
yeah, just you don't have to give your rationale and reasoning behind it or your feelings behind it. Just you don't want to go to breakfast. Yeah, I'm not going. perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something to be said about the oversharing as well. I, I was looking into some uh, some research uh, in preparing for this and that there is evidence that people in relationships when they when they have too many displays of vulnerability associated with negative emotions right like negativity like oh you know i'm struggling with this in my life or that and you know they they show vulnerability too frequently now it may be argued what too frequently might be but do that regularly they actually um tend to be perceived less favorably by their friends and their romantic partners so so vulnerability on the one hand, it's, it's interesting because showing vulnerability on the one hand can strengthen uh, existing relationships and increase trust in a small amount done at the right moment, right? Not done too soon because being doing it too soon would also jeopardize the relationship because it might make the other person feel really uncomfortable. But vulnerability at the right time with the right people, right? It, it, it does increase your trust and your, uh, the strength of your relationship but done too much, and if when it goes into oversharing, it actually negatively impacts your relationship because people then around you feel like you're bringing them down. So that mm. that's interesting, yeah. Because you don't want to be. Uh, do you, you guys use the phrase Debbie Downer? Yeah. Like in Europe. Oh, I haven't yeah. heard it so in like, Europe, but I, I'm aware of the phrase. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, I mean, people say like, "Don't be a Debbie Downer." right? Don't bring us down. Don't bring down the mood. And if you're always sharing this hard stuff, that's not, you know, I want to, I'm someone that we, we both talk about. We love to laugh, yeah. right? We love to laugh. We love to have a good time. We love to talk about the future. We love to talk about, you know, our learnings and growth and enjoy life. I think if you use it as here's what I did and here's where I learned and here's where I'm going to correct from it like i think that that's okay but yeah to just always talk about you know vulnerable stuff and it's like it's not that most exciting stuff to to talk about yeah so it, it, you're right like over over drinks and cocktails on a saturday night would you want someone to sit around and talk about like that stuff so i think that there's a time and a setting and a place absolutely and i think that's important to, to kind of how to navigate yeah and i actually have a personal story which i hope my friend won't mind sharing but uh my best friend yes. and i had this really interesting conversation like a few months ago i was going through a hard time right there were a lot of different things on my mind and i, I was a bit of a debbie downer i'll, I'll be honest right um uh, and i was feeling quite vulnerable in in that moment and of course with my closest friend and she's she's my best friend she's my closest friend i share everything right and I was like, yeah, let me, let me call my friend every time I felt a little bit down. And then uh, just a few weeks ago, I, I met her and uh, she had this important moment in her life um, that she hadn't shared with me earlier. And <clears throat> it was a happy moment. And she told me about it and she told me about it. And it, I, I realized that it actually happened a few weeks earlier and she never told me about it. And it was like, okay, what happened there? You, you, you're the, I'm the first person you call when you have some happy news. This is amazing news. Why didn't you tell me? And we had the most honest talk ever where she actually told me that, you know, I, I, I was a little bit afraid to be happy around you because you were going through something and you felt really sad and you were vulnerable with me. But I thought if I was, if I shared my happy news with you, like it, it, it I don't know. I, she felt guilty about it. And that just broke my heart, Brian. It just broke my heart because that's not what you'd want in a friendship, right? You, you, when I hear some happy news about my friends, I am ecstatic. I'm overjoyed. In fact, it's a source of happiness for me. But when you become so vulnerable with someone and your, your, your emotions are kind of taking over their life as well. Like I, I think that becomes an issue. And for me, that was like, okay, you know what, then we really need to set some boundaries in our friendship. Uh, I do have moments when I feel really down and I need to first self-manage that a little bit before I call you. And let's try to balance the emotions that we have when we talk to each other, right? We're always talking about uh, 
things that are upsetting us, let's let's turn that around. Let's talk about things that are exciting us, things about in the future, things, ideas that we have instead of emotions that we're feeling. And you need to actively also change the conversation to focus less on vulnerability sometimes and uh, maybe explore some other areas if you want to strengthen your friendships. I was It was an important learning for me. I, yeah, just thought I would share. <laughs> That, that I mean, that's a great learning. And that's a, um, I think both can be true. I think you can have the down and you could also have the happy, right? At the same time. I can see where it's coming from is, from her point. I, I, I was in a similar situation like that. So I, I can relate to that too. And um, of not wanting to share that. But then when you really get to talking, you're like, we love each other so much that we want the best for each other all the time. And I, I could be down and you could be up and vice versa. You could be down and I could be up, right? So it's like I'm having this hard time going through this life, you know, and now where it could get kind of tricky would be like if you were going through a breakup and they're getting engaged at the same time, (laughs) right? So like or something like that, right? They're getting married and someone else is getting divorced, right? Or someone else got promoted and you just lost your job, right? Like – so there's situations like that that can be tricky to balance and things like that. But when you really start talking about like, yeah, like that, I want you in my life because I want the what's best for you all the time. I just want you to be happy at all at all times. So having that difficult conversation all, is also important too. And to call that out, that so that's what I'm. That's yeah. what we're talking about. So like vulnerability. That actually was having. That's the difficult thing to actually bring it up. Not the kind like bringing that up. That conversation is like this is uncomfortable, and I'm going to bring this up. But I think we need to have this conversation. Exactly. I think that was a moment of true vulnerability that did that 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 helped our relationship more than any of those other talks where it was just about emotional unloading, right? And I think that's the distinction between vulnerability yeah. and emotional unloading. It's not vulnerability is not there to make you feel good because you've now sort of dropped that burden on someone else, it's having that truly difficult, doing that truly difficult thing or having that truly difficult conversation because it's the right thing to do. And that, that actually was a great moment where we realized, as you said, right, it's, 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 it's both. I mean, we, we need to be there to support each other in bad times and in good and, it's it's hard sometimes when someone is a bit of a downer and you're really happy, but that guilt does not have a place there, right? We, we need to be honest with each other of what we need in that moment. And if she needs me to be there and shut up uh, for a moment to enjoy uh, her happiness. Yes, I'm 100% there. Like, I'm there with the with the balloons and the streamers and everything. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's awesome. And I'm glad you said that, Neha, because I think that there's important nuance there of emotionally dumping versus authenticity, vulnerability, and being real, especially when it comes into work, right? Like, so in work, it could just be like, I can't believe we did this. And I can't believe, you know, we're doing this. And this, this client asked me to do this and I I'm super busy at work and I'm drowning and I gotta, or it's just frustration and venting. That is totally different from, I'm really struggling right now. I could use an extra hand for, you know, is there a project team member that I can get? Cause I'm really struggling to keep up right now. I'm not making my deliverables. I, I'm making mistakes that are continuous and then understanding, okay, is it a capability? Is it a development? Is it a capacity? Like what is, but sharing that, that I'm struggling right now at work because of, X, Y, Z, and I could use some support is different from saying, I can't believe leadership went in the strategic direction. I can't believe we're going. That's dumping and that's bending. To me, that's not vulnerability. That's complaining and that's not kind of not what I want to be around. Exactly. Good. I, yeah, Brian, I think I could go on for another hour and, and talk about this, but we're nearing the end and, um, I want to wrap up by asking you uh, to finish this sentence. Um, when I drop my armor, I? I feel me. I feel 
I, feel, I just, I feel me. I feel accepted. I feel who I am, right? I feel that there is no armor. There is no wall. It's just like me wide open, just being who I am. And it, it's very hard to, ex, it's very hard to explain, I would say. But like you just, like nothing, no, nothing's hidden. It's almost like, yeah, like, can you ask that? Yeah. Ask that. <laughs> uh, how do you, how do you phrase this? I don't, it just, it, cause it seems so basic and it seems so basic and simple. Cause it's like, yeah, I just feel me. Like I feel genuine. I feel this sense of relief. I feel authentic. I feel me. I feel, I feel fine. I feel free. I feel free. There we go. I feel like free and I feel like this almost like the sense of like just relief all the time. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. As the year comes to an end, on behalf of the Dropping Your Armor team, I want to thank you all for tuning in, listening, and supporting this podcast. We wish you happy holidays good health, good fortune, and a wonderful start to the new year. And now, to end, let's hear a short recap of what it means to drop your armor from all of our guests. When I drop my armor, I am my authentic self. I will uh, talk more about my uh, personal emotions and feelings. I wish someone somewhere is doing it too. I think when I drop my armor, I'm genuine, or I'm authentic, or maybe I'm the real self. I am safe. I become stronger. I want to feel safe and then be very transparent. I rarely drop my armor. I think I need my armor in my job, actually. You know, to be the CHRO, you know, or to be, you know, where I am, I think I need my armor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> When I drop my armor, uh, the love shines more and it helps other people to drop their armor. When I drop my armor, I am free.